this evening I'm very happy to welcome um, Father Louis Roy from Ottawa, Canada to be our lecturer. He's here for the semester. He's teaching in the honors program and giving little talks here and there, but I'm delighted that he's here on the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, I, when I was in the seminary, that was a very special day, the feast of Thomas Aquinas. And um, he's someone who's worth reaching, spending time reaching up to his mind so that our minds can be what they should be and see the world as it should be seen. So I'll just read a little bit about Father Watt and, uh, and then introduce him. And, uh, and finally, I'll, uh, I'll say a prayer from the Mass today for St. Thomas Aquinas. Reverend Louis Waugh, the Order of Preachers, holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge. After teaching for 21 years at Boston College, he is now Professor of Theology at the Dominican University College in Ottawa, Canada. He has published books in English, French, Spanish, and Vietnamese, even Vietnamese. He is interested in intellectual, affective, and mystical approaches to God, in religious experience and revelation, in interreligious dialogue, and the relations between Christianity and cultures. This semester, the Center for Catholic Studies welcomes Father Louis as the Toth Lonergan Chair for Interdisciplinary Studies to teach student courses and participate in faculty development here at Seton Hall University. And so I'll just read, uh, as we begin, I'll just read the prayer from today's Mass, um, the prayer of the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. O God, who made St. Thomas Aquinas outstanding in his zeal for holiness and his study of sacred doctrine, grant us, we pray, that we may understand what he taught and imitate what he accomplished. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Brother Ron. I hope you have applauded for Thomas Aquinas and Bernard Lonergan, about whom I will speak tonight. I thank you, Monsieur Didi, for your kind words, and also kind all, already a good number of good um, friends of mine at uh, Seton Hall who have made my landing from Canada smooth and pleasant. You see the, the program of, uh, of what I would like to talk about, uh, beginning with Catholic theology since Vatican II. Is, um, do you hear me easily? it uh, a bit closer, like this? This is better? Good. Okay. Yeah. It's multi-directional, so that, but in a way I have to be close enough. Let me know if you, if it's really, you're not here. Okay, so, uh, many theologians and seminarians and uh, students uh, in the Western world are thought that uh, Vatican II had ignored Thomas Aquinas and that Thomas Aquinas doctrines were, had become obsolete. There was a, a movement in the late 60s and 70s uh, to this effect. Uh, um, at the Council, if you read the documents, there are few references to Thomas Aquinas. John XXIII wanted uh, that the Council would more um, be pastoral and therefore some updating and there was the influence of, uh, of existentialism, of phenomenology, 
uh, sociology of religion, the surveys about what is, what is going on in the Western world. So it, it is a fact. No expi few explicit references, but you, uh, if you know the thought of Aquinas, you would recognize many doctrines by Aquinas presented by the Council, Second Vatican Council. So after Vatican II, Catholic theology uh, was very creative. It has begun to be creative, uh, let's say, after the First World War, uh, with Rahner uh, and um, um, von Balthasar, Lonergan, and others. So it was creative, but uh, there was, uh, on most theologians, a quasi-total lack of norms, namely of firm guidelines about doctrine. So the creativity was extolled so much that if, if the theologian had bright ideas that would be worth publishing, it's a lot of bright ideas, and you, you pick and choose. We, sometimes we, we call that uh, cafeteria Catholicism, or, or, you know, because you pick what you want on the cafeteria table. Uh, so there was at that time in the 1970s and on after that, either to unitarily go back to the Church Fathers, that had been a patristic renewal beginning around in the 1940s with the Jesuits and the Dominicans in Lyon, France. Wonderful. And uh, the Pope had said also there should be a resource or not, using the French word, huh, to go to the source. And the sources are, uh, in addition to the Bible, of course, the Church Fathers. So that was good. But unilaterally going back to the Church Fathers uh, was a mistake. And you cannot stop with the Church Fathers. Others would unilaterally go back to Aquinas. And to this day, there are Thomists who live in the world of Thomas uh, and ignore what has been added over many centuries, practically speaking. So it's not necessarily an intention, but in practice they do that. So you go to patristics or to the medievals, including also, of course, Bonaventure, the great Franciscan. Uh, there are two actualizers that I praise, Hans Ostman Balthasar, a Swiss priest, uh, and Fernand Lanagan. So, because of that situation of uh, free creativity, and there was a backlash, there was a, a reaction on the part of the conservatives. And uh, they, without using the word, which comes from Lonergan, uh, they were classicists. Classicist. So, according to my reading of Lonergan's thought about this, you have, you had, and you still have, we still have three possibilities. Uh, adopting a classicist notion of culture, which overemphasizes the permanence of doctrine. John again was in favor of the permanence of doctrine, and you have long sections of, I think it's chapter 12 of Method and Theology about this, a chapter called Doctrines. But you could, uh, nevertheless, uh, emphasize doctrine excessively in the sense that uh, we'll see a bit later what it means, this famous classicism. Uh, the, the other possibility is the other extreme. There are two extremes. Radical pluralism. I italicize radical, which amounts to relativism. And halfway between these first two positions, that is in the right middle, if you follow the idea of Aristotle, a virtuous mean, uh, the mean, the, the middle point, halfway between two extremes. Well, a sound understanding of human intentionality, intentionality mean, meaning the, uh, the, the movement of the human mind towards 
reality, we intend to discover objectively reality, what exists. So a sound understanding of human intentionality, which goes along with an empirical notion of culture, then this is what I call a moderate pluralism. If you read uh, um, Lonergan, who you have, he, he, he extols pluralism, but I think that today we live with current discussions, he would say, my understanding of pluralism is a moderate pluralism, not radical pluralism, which amounts to relativism. And you know that uh, Pope uh, uh, Benedict has said that finally, uh, uh, relativism is so uh, important and imposed by many teachers on others and the media also that it is a tyranny. And Pope Francis, in one of his very few, uh, very early speeches, used the expression by uh, his predecessor, Pope Benedict. So, halfway between the two extremes, there is this uh, position by Lonergan, which is moderate pluralism. Here, what he has to say about classicist understanding or notion of culture. Am I talking too loud or not loud enough? Seems, seems to be good. Okay, I will stay close to the microphone and read this um, definition. It's a quote from Lonergan. The classicist notion of culture was normative. At least the Uri, there was but one culture that was both universal and permanent. To its norms and ideals might aspire the uncultured, whether they were the young or the people uh, or the natives or the barbarians. You know that the Greek in the classical age would call the non-Greeks barbarians. They had the notion of culture, which was their culture, period. Besides the classicists, there is also the empirical notion of culture. It is a set, this is the definition, it is the set of meanings and values that informs a way of life. It may remain unchanged for ages, it may be in process of slow development or rapid dissolution. Classicist culture was stable. It took its stand on what ought to be. And what ought to be is not to be refuted by what is. Slight English Canadian humor there. It is legislated with its eye on the substance of things, on the unchanging essence of human living, and while it never doubted either that circumstances alter cases, or that circumstances change, still it is also, it also was quite sure that its essences did not change. Still, uh, that change affected only the accidental details that were of no great account. So no classicists would be dumb enough to imagine that there is no change. But all the changes, especially among Catholics, were accidental. So you could have, you could study, as a matter of fact, only the church fathers, or only the medievals, or only the church and, uh, councils, and that would be the, the Catholic culture. Classicist culture, by conceiving itself normatively and universally, also had to think of itself as the one and only culture for all time. So, he advocates, Lonergan advocates, an empirical notion of culture, empirical meaning uh, based on observation. Uh, you have the culture of, uh, of uh, black Af Africa, you know, and it's kind of a common culture, but, and this is different, and this is, uh, they can be good Catholics while remaining uh, uh, embedded in, in their own culture. So, uh, he wrote in the late 60s, after the Council, what is going forward in Catholic circles is a disengagement from the forms of classicist culture 
and a transposition into the forms of modern culture. The contemporary notion of culture is empirical. A culture is a set of meanings and values informing a common way of life. And there are as many cultures as there are distinct sets of such meanings and values. However, this manner of conceiving culture is relatively recent. It is a product of empirical human studies. Within less than 100 years, it has replaced an older classicist view that had flourished for over two millennia. Our disengagement from classicism and our involvement in modernity must be open-eyed, critical, critical of uh, the, the cultures that we observe and discuss, critical, coherent, sure-footed. If we are not just to throw out what is good in classicism and replace it with contemporary trash, then we have to take the trouble, and it is enormous, to grasp the strength and the weakness, the power and the limitations, the good points and the shortcomings of both classicism and modernity. Just a word about um, when this uh, classicist understanding of culture really began. Langdon never told us. Of course, there is the Greek world, and uh, we know that. So the, the Greeks and the barbarians. We, we know. But it is really, in my opinion, in the 18th century, uh, and with the idea of a natural religion, in the um, French uh, encyclopedist in Voltaire, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know, so they would say, because to escape the, um, the, um, the wars of religion, which uh, they remembered at that time in the 17th century and 18th century, uh, they, they said, we're going to agree on a common basis, but the supernatural was eliminated. So you have a so-called it's so, sometimes it's called deism. Voltaire called it theism, that means a, a common God. But Christ is not a, a God, the sacraments are invalid, etc. So that, that was the idea. And then when they conquered France, uh, England, uh, uh, Spain, uh, Portugal, and many, uh, even Italy, uh, and America at the end, uh, the, uh, the missionaries were classicists, but it was not only the missionaries, it was also those empires. Uh, for instance, in France, they would say that we go to Africa and to Indochina, in Vietnam and other countries, with the idea of civilizing them. Civilization was understood as the French civilization, or more broadly, European. To civilize if you know a little bit of Buddhism, it's, it's laughable. To civilize the people of Indochina, the Buddhists, that's laughable, really. It's certainly incredible. No sense of the values of, uh, of that culture. Or in, in China, Confucianism. So, uh, so it's part of something that was not um, only Catholic. It was the whole, you know, um, most of the most important nations and powerful nations in Europe and also in the United States that had this idea of we civilize them. So, classicism, you see. So, uh, it's still among us, this mentality. That's why I'm addressing that. You'll see the consequences for how we read and interpret Thomas Aquinas shortly. So, now, the empirical notion of culture, we continue to explain it. It's the, it, the, it amounts to historical consciousness. Elias, according to you, historical mindedness. And that began, be, began this sense of history, this modern sense of history, in the 18th century, uh, with Lessing and uh, others. And after that, it continued in the 19th century, among, among uh, German exegetes, for instance, and, and uh, those people. But it's accepted, it was accepted by the Second Vatican Council, many church father, council fathers, and also by Pope Paul VI. Quote, in theological matters, a modern, moderate, moderate, 
diversity of opinions is compatible with unity in faith and with fidelity concerning doctrines and the norms of the magisterium. I will skip the one by Thomas Quinn, who insists also to, on the methodology uh, in, uh, uh, in studies that are historical-minded. You need a methodology, the historical method. You situate uh, a text uh, in, in its context. Uh, for instance, Luther, if you don't understand what Luther, uh, what kind of world he was living, what kind of culture, uh, and uh, what happened to him, and what happened to the reaction among, the, among Rome, or what he, and then he hardened, and said, oh, all of this historical, uh, all those historical facts yeah, are very important to understand Luther, what he was up to. Okay, so another thing that also is important if you read Thomas Aquinas is the importance of religious experience uh, in the first in the 21st century, and then if we go back, we see that it was important for the church fathers and for the medievals. Uh, for instance, uh, so it, in um, the 21st century, uh, the concern for eternity is very, very, very remarkable uh, in the sense that many people said, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual, you heard that, but there is a hunger there first that we should not discard the art. There is a certain openness, but there's a lot of idolatry in the way that they have idols to become a spiritual person. So it's kind of very ambiguous, this notion. So we have also to, as I'm going to suggest, be critical, but also open to what is there and are stepping stones towards a possible um, discovery by them of Jesus. So Jesus, the prayerful Jesus, you know, who would spend nights in prayer, uh, isolated in the mountain, and then choose his disciples, for instance. Well, he's, he's a great model. In his humanity, he prayed and was really united with the Father. That's why he could be so courageous uh, in the face of opposition, and finally uh, he was uh, liquidated, he was murdered, or he died on the cross. Other, um, other names that I admire very much, Albert the Great, the master of Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas himself, Meister Eckhart. It's incredible how the Dominican Meister Eckhart, 14th century, is popular in Germany, in France, in the English-speaking world, in Japan. I spent three months in Japan, and I discovered that for them, the best mystic uh, is Eckhart, you know, Master Eckhart, they're interested. I met a Jesuit in Tokyo several times who was a specialist of Zen and uh, I said, well, William Johnston, wonderful man, whose works are very readable. If you want to read something interesting, comparing with Buddhism, etc. And he told me, uh, I, I'm trying to, to make the Japanese who are interested in, in Christian spirituality read John of the Cross. And, uh, I agree that even though I'm a Dominican and Master Eckhart was a Dominican, John of course was a, a better mystic, a greater mystic. So you have to make them discover. But the Japanese have a kind of disdain for Spanish culture. Well, the Philippines were not too far, and there has kind of a, a block, blockage there. So we have to make them discover. But I read many things by, by Buddhists. Uh, on a cart, and it's very interesting. One of them was sent by his master uh, in, in Kyoto, who was sent to Germany and wrote his doctoral dissertation on Meister Eckhart. And he was the first Japanese who really understood medieval culture. If you don't understand the religious, again, you're, not, you're going to misread Meister Eckhart. And that happens also very often. The, the sentences are taken out of context and they make him say things that he, he could never have said, a man of the 14th century, see. Uh, so, um, in the, so others also that I mentioned, uh, um, Jacques and Raissa Maritain are known, philosopher of Maritain. She, Raissa was a pure mystic, she was, a, she was a Jewish uh, before becoming Christian, and also uh, she was an artist, she was a poet, and, she was really the mystical presence in the house near Versailles, 
in which many people came to, uh, to discuss uh, the, the thought of Thomas Aquinas and also to pray and meditate. So um, religious experience has always also been present in the Jewish uh, traditions, biblical and also post-biblical, and the Christian traditions. Uh, the, the remarkable uh, change that was nevertheless a remarkable change in the 12th century, because the church fathers, when they talk about mysticism, with a few exceptions, they talk about doctrine. They want to present us kind of the, the, the revealed mystery of salvation. So you have the uh, no differentiation between spirituality and dogma. It's all together. It's holistic. That's very good. But it's in the 12th century, the century before Thomas Aquinas, uh, they began to focus on the religious experience much more than before. So there was a change there. I mean, Bernard of Clairvaux, the Cistercians, the Victorines, uh, William, uh, etc. Uh, so Aquinas states that besides what he calls speculative knowledge, there is another one which is, quote, an affective and experiential knowledge whereby a person experiences in oneself the taste of divine sweetness and the delight in divine will. This, this is a consolation, and Ignatius of Loyola would say. But in that, in that world, they would rather say sweetness, <laughs> and then begin consolation, different uh, way of uh, writing. So now, brands of Thomism, and that will be, a, I hope, helpful to guide you in the, what you can find as guides. Oh, I have a, something that I forgot to say. Uh, to be interested in what we call the classics, uh, like Shakespeare, or for us, a uh, French speaker, as uh, uh, Racine. Uh, someone said, if you love Racine, you have understood France. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, et cetera. So they are really Iliad, you know, Homer, Homer, etc. They are classics. Uh, and the great, the great study, the study of the great works, huh? great writings, launched by the University of Chicago many years ago, many decades ago. That was that was it. So someone who is a classicist can be interested in the classics, but someone who is a non-classicist or an empirical-minded person can also be interested in a classic. In other words, someone can be can accept the definition of culture as empirical definition, but nevertheless be interested in the classics. So it's not the abandonment of the classics, you see? So you can have a kind of an ambiguity that uh, I'm trying to unravel. Okay, so the brands of um, Thomism. You have the Thomism of the commentators, and that began in the late 14th century, early 15th century, with Capriolus. Capriolus. And he commented on the Summa Theologiae by Thomas Aquinas. And Lonergan says that was a mistake. You're too far away from the Bible and from the Church Fathers when you comment on the synthesis by Thomas Aquinas. To be, you have to listen to the straight eye. And the Bible is always has always a primacy. So he was a Dominican. Uh, then you you have Cajetan uh, in the 16th century. He was sent by the Pope. Uh, he was he had become a cardinal. He was master of the Dominican order. Then a cardinal. He was sent by the Pope to meet Luther. Luther had not bro broken with the Catholic Church at that time. But very interesting, instead of saying, uh, which uh, I think today we would say, oh, Martin, brother Martin, uh, maybe we have something in common. You believe in grace, don't you? You believe in scripture and listening to the word of God, especially uh, transmitted by Jesus. You have faith in Christ that has changed your life. You would say, yeah, you know, it would be a, a, a dialogue. But, but, Cajetan, so rich see that because he was a Dominican, but nevertheless, we have to state the truth. 
he began with the question, Martin, do you believe in the indulgences? <laughs> it was the end. It was a, it was a failure. So maybe the, the history of, of humanity would have been different in those few minutes, instead of uh, saying, well, uh, I'm an Italian, Caterton, Cayetano, he is a German, they have problems there with the indulgences, the economics, and well, the money going from Germany to Rome, blah, 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 blah. and also, uh, what is it that Luther, what was, was good in Luther's experience and message? No. So I'm really critical of the commentators. You will see that. Other, other examples, you have Banyes, the Dominican, and Molina, the Jesuit, about grace. And promotes your, uh, what is it? Promotes your uh, promotion, uh, this kind of graces, uh, this kind of emotion uh, given you know, to, uh, to someone who receives grace. Uh, and Nonagon wrote, uh, after one month in studying, the, he said, I was brought up a Molinist, like all Jews with work. They were on the side of Molina. The Dominicans were all on the side of Banyas. And he said, after a month, I discovered that, um, that Molina had nothing to contribute to the understanding of Thomas Aquinas. Boom. <laughs> he didn't say that by yes, but I believe. So he really, in his um, doctoral dissertation, Grace, which was published later, uh, he really uh, discovered something which was, I think, I taught Grace many times in the US, uh, was really the good understanding, the right understanding of what Thomas had said. Suarez, well, another Jesuit who thought he had uh, understood the thought of Thomas Aquinas and he was just rephrasing it for the early 17th century, Suarez in Spain. But he was half Thomist and half Scotist. That would be a long thing. If you want to talk about conceptualism at the Christian period, maybe we could go back to Scotus. So uh, Suarez um, was. Um, a mistake, in, uh, and I, I heard of uh, Jesuits uh, who told me that their teachers had ceased being Swazirian to become Thomists. Isn't that interesting? They were bright enough to, to admit that, and they were humble enough to realize that Thomas Aquinas was a genius, but Suarez had misinterpreted to a certain degree in saying everything he said was false. false. Then you have John Poinsot, uh, religious name was John of St. Thomas, another commentator. He would deduct, not begin with experience, but with um, doctrines, and deduct um, theological statements from that process. Inferring conclusions from premises, uh, etc. So, but he has a wonderful commentary on a section of the Summa Theologiae titled De Doni Spiritus Sancti, uh, the, on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then you feel someone who knew what he was talking about. So, uh, probably a mystic, John of St. Thomas. Then you have the last one. He, 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 he died in the late 50s and he taught at the Gregorian, at the, oh, at the Angelicum, which is the University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. Uh, at the same time as Lonergan, he would finish, he was about to finish, and Lonergan had just arrived. You may have heard of him in, the, in, in those days, in the, in the 50s. We have Igu Lagrange of the French, and he was uh, the arch uh, classicist, absolutely pure. He had resolved to attack all the modern ideas, everything modern was false for him, and he was campaigning. And when I went to the Angelicum for the Lonergan workshop and uh, Monsieur Bidé was there, uh, I um, lived with the Dominicans uh, next door, where Gabriel had lunch taught. And I asked the librarian, who was an, uh, uh, an American Dominican, could you give me two things, not too long, about, about, um, about Gabriel Lagrange? Where was he born? What, how is it? Uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And then I read that and I said, Oh, Lonergan must have thought of every goo when he, he coined the, the expression. Uh, um, I'm just not working. A classicist. The classicist was next door. 
And the guy who Lagrange was really very, very influential. He was a, a very pious man, perhaps a mystic. And he had uh, students like Lonergan from many continents, South America, uh, North America, uh, Belgium, France, Italy, of course, and uh, Germany, you see. So both were influential. But I said to myself, you know, I'm, of course, those who know me know that I admire what the, the Dominicans of the 20th century achieved, Cogar, especially, Chenu, and others. But nevertheless, I must uh, admit that Gary Wu really uh, did not have a, a good theological influence. The other one is historical Thomism, and you may have heard the names of the Agilsa, who discovered the sources of Descartes, and that was a big splash in the Sorbonne in the, when he did his doctoral dissertation on that, um, on that topic, because um, Descartes thought he had begun from scratch huh, with universal doubt, and what is it that is really emerges from that? The cogito, because if I doubt, I think. So I doubt, I think, and then I exist. I am cogito ergo sum. So Gilson was really uh, the promoter of historical Thomism in France, followed by uh, the Dominican Chenu, and then Congar, and nowadays he's still living, published much. Uh, Jean-Pierre Torel, T O L R E L L. Jean-Pierre Torel, the French Dominican, who used to teach in Switzerland, in, in Fribourg. And his big uh, two volume uh, study of uh, Aquinas, translated almost immediately after the French published it, uh, is really available in English and it's really a source, a great source of. Uh, good uh, historical approach. Gilles Emery, his successor in Fribourg, La Salle, and the same line. Updated Thomism, Maritain, especially in political philosophy. Rahner, called a transcendental Thomist. Uh, Bernard Lannan. Then you have post-liberal Thomism that's very interesting. It's also called the Yale School. Uh, and the Yale uh, Protestant teachers became interested in Thomas Aquinas, and then you have uh, George Lindbeck, who uh, was uh, work for the joint uh, declaration, Lutheran, Roman Catholic, published, signed in Germany by the Catholic Church and also the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Lutheran uh, Federation in 1999. It's a very interesting development. Monsignor uh, Redano uh, has a wonderful book which I've just finished reading on the process which uh, made them achieve this declaration. It was not without difficulties, but it worked. And then after that, Methodists joined seven years later. The, uh, the Anglicans, the Reformed, so that's very uh, encouraging to have. Uh, it was the, excuse me, the an agreement on, on justification. And of course, Cardinal Ratzinger was very precise, said, doesn't mean that uh, we had agreement on other uh, understandings, like for instance, the Eucharist, or other, but on justification, we really think that our faith is, is the same. But the perspectives, the approach, the language, as well, languages are different. Uh, so um, it's called post-liberal uh, Thomism because, you know, of course, the Yale School, Lübeck was, uh, was uh, one of the last, is one of the last in that uh, wonderful succession. Um, uh, they were, of course, they, they were very influenced by Karl Barth, who was against the liberal theology in which he was brought up around 1900. So then, hence, post-liberal. And there is an article uh, by, uh, by Bruce Marshall, the disciple of Lindbeck, who uh, argued in the Thomas, the Dominican periodical in Washington, argued that Thomas Aquinas was a post-liberal. <laughs> so it's a bit far-fetched. I replied to Bruce Marshall in the, in the Thomas, and he, he had a rejoinder about me, etc. So, but uh, it's not totally false. And finally, the analytical Thomism, it was, uh, this was, uh, became uh, with Elizabeth Anscombe, uh, 
who was the, probably the best disciple of Ludwig Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein who taught in, in Cambridge, England, for many, many years. And she converted along with her husband, Peter Geach, and she taught me at, uh, at uh, Cambridge. And uh, she uh, was, uh, they were atheists and they converted and they were received into the Catholic Church in Oxford by the Dominicans. It's kind of a story that I kind of like. <laughs> she took me under her wings. <laughs> And, uh, but uh, so she initiated that become, of course, because of her Catholicism, she became interested in Thomas and then she went to Aristotle and discovered the limitation of analytic philosophy. You see. So, but nevertheless, she never turned her back on what she had learned with Wittgenstein, who in my opinion was a genius. The other one is John Aldane, a Scot, who teaches half time in. Uh, Texas and the other half time is in the University of uh, St. Andrew in uh, Scotland. And this is the, the post uh, the post analytical uh, or analytical Thomism. He writes in the Thomist, uh, um, sorry, in uh, the tablet frequently, and he's a very interesting thinker. So finally, conclusion about the complementarity uh, of uh, Thomist and non Thomist for the future of Christianity. But you know that uh, Lonergan has a book, Method in Theology, and he has uh, uh, eight functional specialties, and he argues that we must work in teams, we must work together. So you could no longer have Thomas in their world, which is uh, increasing at the moment, and also because of the danger of, uh, of classicism or um, other theologians and philosophers that ignore Thomism completely. They think it's obsolete. So what is interesting is uh, the, the capacity, because of this method by Lamagan, of discerning uh, the tradition with capital T uh, in the singular, uh, one tradition, amidst the various traditions in the plural, uh, with a small t, uh, and that requires a considerable amount of collaborative scholarship. So we need the non thomists we need the, the specialists, uh, the biblical researchers, we need and we have to come together and exchange ideas and uh, re-express Kathleen Doctrine, Kathleen Doctrine, Kathleen Doctrine, Kathleen Doctrine.